Hey guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Brad Schoenfeld back on the show. It's always great chatting to Brad. He always has such a wise, level-headed approach, and I always appreciate his perspective on things, and uh, it wasn't a disappointment at all in this episode. We talk a bit about the research that's coming out of his lab, some interesting stuff coming out on deloads, which I'm very interested to dig more into. We talk about it a little bit on this episode. We dig into the training at long muscle length literature, low load training, and the mechanisms of hypertrophy. Is Brad ready to throw out muscle damage and the pump, cell swelling, uh, metabolic stress as potential avenues to hypertrophy? You're going to find out today. And as a reminder, guys, it's always appreciated when you share the podcast. If you're watching uh, over on YouTube, drop us a comment, drop us a like, make sure to subscribe. If you are over on Spotify or the like, a rating would be really valued. Five stars if possible, always appreciated. And of course, share it. Let us know, tag us on Instagram. And uh, without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Brad Schoenfeld back on the show. Uh, I think I said this last time, Brad, but it seems to be every year that I uh, think about Brad and I'm like, I start to like, I reach out to bring you on and it just seems to be something that flows every year. We get an update on you. So it's great to have you back. Last time was episode 297. And we were talking about your recently published kind of second edition of the Max Muscle Plan. And uh, yeah, we dug into a bit of that, but how, how are things on your end? Uh, anything changed? Yeah, first of all, it's great to see your success. Um, has anything changed? No, nothing's really changed, but a lot of stuff is moving on. And uh, I mean, certainly a lot of new research. I, I want to give a shout out first to my students, my master's students who I, I do feel I'm somewhat biased, but I have the best master's students on the planet. And uh, they're highly motivated, highly passionate. And uh, really, I couldn't do what I do without their help. But we have just a bunch of research. We can get into some of that if you want as to uh, new stuff that's either just came out or coming out. So yeah, for sure. No, I know uh, I was, I saw Max Coleman was one person just because uh, it was a, year, a few years ago, I was coaching him and I saw him pop up and like related to you. And I was like, I didn't actually even realize he'd kind of take the plunge to go and work in your lab. So that that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Seeing all the connections. Yeah. So I, I mean, we have, um, I'll give you just a few highlights. We just published a paper on creatine for hypertrophy, the effects of creatine. And until we published this, all the studies, all the uh, made analyses on creatine were specific to fat-free mass, and they showed fairly large gains in fat-free mass. So it was interesting. The uh, paper, the made analysis, did show a benefit to creatine for hypertrophy, but it was smaller than that for fat-free mass. And um, it leads us to speculate why would the why wouldn't you see roughly equal magnitudes of effect and we were hypothesizing it could be that there's some extracellular water uh, that is stored uh, from creatine. So it's anyway, we think this it was kind of interesting. We think this needs more investigation. Another interesting finding there was that the uh, younger individuals seem to get better results than older individuals. And again, not really clear why we speculate it might be that perhaps older people aren't able to train as hard and thus not be able to take advantage of the resynthesis uh, of ATP. So anyway, I thought that was kind of a cool study. Just that it's open access. Um, we have a oh, study that was... Sorry, Brad. Just on that one, the, my bodybuilding head goes immediately to extracellular water. And I think for peaking, and I'm like, I want like, cause that could be an implication. I'm sure I've heard people talk about potentially removing creatine and most people are like don't worry about it it's stored within the muscle so that's inter if that does come out that that could be interesting i mean people are coming on stage peeled with creatine in so maybe they could be even leaner without it i don't know yeah here's or what i would it. say is that given the hypothesis you might want to rethink it like everything is cost benefit until we get greater clarity and it could be completely a, a different thing <laughs> you know it's when you try to speculate you what other explanation is there that's what you start thinking yeah. um now i guess i could give an alternative explanation that measures of fat-free mass are less sensitive than looking at direct imaging message uh methods that are used for looking at hypertrophy so could that be could it just be that we're not we're getting more accurate uh determinations here that's possible as well yeah yeah and i guess if you remove it you also lose anything that was stored within the muscle too. So you're kind of 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting question is how long do those uh, results stay? So, I mean, yeah. perhaps if you gave it up, so like that, it comes down to timing at that point. You know, if you give it up, uh, so let's say seven days a week before your show, uh, would that have an effect? We just don't know these things. So anyway. Something to experiment with, I think, actually. That's interesting. Um, we have another study. Um, it was the thesis of my student, Avery Rosa. Uh, congrats to him. He uh, finished his thesis. And we here we looked, it was an acute study at one minute rest, two minutes rest, three minutes rest in the squat and in the uh, leg extension. This has just been accepted. It should be published shortly, I would, I would assume and hope. And uh, again, interesting results. And what we found was, is that there really was no difference. So we looked at recovery. And we looked at different measures, but the primary one was the loss of repetitions. We also looked at lactate response, uh, rating of perceived exertion. But I think the loss of repetitions was the most interesting one because that has implications for volume load, which potentially, of course, can be a hypertrophic mech uh, 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 leading into hypertrophy. And um, we showed that uh, two minutes rest and three minutes rest had roughly similar results as far as the loss they had roughly similar losses in repetitions but one minute rest had substantially more uh, you know meaningfully more so it doesn't seem that over two minutes is really necessary which is kind of an interesting thing it also was kind of interesting there wasn't much difference between the squat and the leg extension uh, both of them showed similar drop-offs between repetition ranges so i thought that was interesting um we have another one, another meta, which is uh, just being just going into review that looked at the CWI called water immersion and its effect on hypertrophy. And uh, bottom line there is that it has a negative effect. Fairly modest, but uh, certainly something you wouldn't want to use all the time if your goal is to maximize hypertrophy. I certainly would not think the occasional use would have any uh, negative effects, but. Um, that seems to be the the big trend, the cold plunge at the moment. At least some people are doing it in the morning. It seems I haven't I haven't uh, attempted any of it. So, <laughs> well, and, and by the way, that's actually another interesting point is that the timing was always in a in a close proximity. Uh, so all the studies really have used 10, 15, 20 minutes proximity to the resistance training bout. If you're let's say doing cold water in the morning and then training in the evening, we don't know. Um, you know, is that enough time? We could speculate that the rationale, the mechanistic aspect of the uh, negative effect is due to reduced blood flow and perhaps the effects of that on uh, reductions in inflammatory responses. So that's all speculation, but perhaps if you leave enough time, that would not then be detrimental to blood flow, to tissues for recovery. Um, couple others, we have a supervision study uh, that is in review now. Uh, I'll give you, you get a scoop on this one. And we had one group, two groups did the exact same routine. One of them was fully supervised. The other not supervised. It was actually done on pretty much the same equipment in our own facility. And uh, pretty major differences. Supervision had a pretty big difference. So what this shows to me is that if you're carrying out a research study, you want to have it and you're focusing on hypertrophy and the, at least the muscles that you're looking at, uh, have it supervised. If you're just giving people routines and then having them come back. And again, now these weren't high level bodybuilders, but they were resistance trained subjects. So perhaps someone like yourself, that would be a valid way to go about doing it. But um, in just recreationally trained subjects, when they, I mean, they had three, four years experience, it was detrimental. And finally, uh, the Max Coleman, who was in, by the way, just a uh, badass student. He is a future superstar in the field. He's already a research stud, but truly a future superstar. And uh, you should at one point get him on your show. But uh, he's he just finished up his thesis. We just finished up data collection. And he looked at deloads. So it's the first study to look at deloads, more traditional deloads, in um, resistance-trained individuals. And now we didn't do a, the... We did a version of deload which involved detraining, so basically an active recovery, uh, as opposed to doing like a reduction in volume. And um, 
I'm not going to uh, trump you on the results here, but uh, what I will tell you is, is that it probably is going to be changing my thought process on how I uh, program for deloads going into the future. So uh, I'll give more because there's a lot of nuance that I don't want to get into and sure. uh, at this point before it's published, but uh, really interesting findings. And it's, again, preliminary, the first study of what hopefully will be a lot more. But um, yeah, we found some interesting results there. So was the the active rest just a, a week off the gym completely? Yeah, yeah. So we did okay. a nine-week routine. One group trained nine weeks straight. The other did four weeks, then a week off. Week off from lifting. They could do whatever they want, you know, actively outside of lifting weights. And then four more weeks of training. And did you have a, another group doing like a different type of deload or? No. Can I? Oh, okay. Just two groups. So we had one group that was uh, training continuously. The other okay. group was deloading. And uh, we did all sorts of measurements. We did hypertrophy at multiple. And we just, by the way, we just looked at lower body hypertrophy. So it was a lower body study, but, and we pushed the shit out of these people. So they were, <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we pushed them. They did 20 sets for their, all their muscle groups. We gave, so we gave them a routine to do on their own for their upper body. And we personally okay. supervised their lower body training. So they were doing a total of like 20 sets for all the muscle groups combined. So like 140 sets total for all the muscle groups per week. So, you know, high volume and we pushed the shit out of them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they were, they, and to a man, they all said it was, and a woman, because it was men and women, but to uh, to a subject, they all said it was the hardest they've ever trained. So. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me if, so were the, the sets all taken to like uh, yeah, monetary yeah, yeah. failure? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So 20 sets, I mean, that's a, 20 sets for one muscle group's hard, like let alone now trying to well, do it. It, for it, every it wasn't all in one, so it was spread out over two sessions. So yeah. uh, we did, you know, 10 sets, one session, 10 sets, the other. Okay. So yeah, you said it, I think you said it's changed potentially your philosophy towards deloading. And I don't know if that means you now, I don't know if that I'm assuming that means you're not now not deloading <laughs> and then maybe your approach to deloading is changing, well, it's, but it's now I'm fishing. Approach. It's more of my approach, <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk again, or you perhaps you can have Max on. For and, sure. Uh, he can go through the study, but yeah, we hope to have that. We're going to be submitting it within the next few weeks. And hopefully if all goes well, I would hope before the end of the year, we have it published. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I have, I have thoughts on it, of course, probably similar to yourself, but you had thoughts on it before going in there and you had your own kind of programming philosophy. So it's great actually, just like you said, I think you said there's not really any research, particularly on deloading. Like it's all kind of inferences off other research that maybe can provide some rationales for us. Correct. And there was, so there's been some interesting, um, somewhat acute research and some, uh, some applied research too, but there's been some mostly acute research that shows a potential resensitization of, uh, of anabolism where the muscle becomes, has a greater re resensitization and, uh, including, uh, intracellular signaling, muscle protein, synth the, the muscle protein synthetic response. Um, so anyway, that's why we chose, and that's from detraining. That's why we chose a detraining rather than a deloading. So you can't necessarily, by the way, I will say too, that you can't necessarily extrapolate what we found to someone, to someone who just does a more traditional deload, if you want to say that, if that really is more traditional. I think most people, when they deload, uh, certainly that was my effect uh, or, or my approach was to use a reduction in volume and intensity. Yeah. So, um, but still just the results, but how they came out still are going to make me have made me rethink my approach. So cool. we'll talk, we'll talk more in the future. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, and I know Dr. Pack's been doing some like, uh, interview based research on this as well. So again, I bet a, a lot of the people might've changed their thoughts based off this coming out as well, or, or modify them maybe. Well, Dr. Pack is in the study. He actually, oh. he, uh, the, I will say this. Shout out to Dr. Pack. He is now a visiting scholar in our lab. And yeah, he uh, spent a good amount of time. He helped with the training of the subjects. Uh, and he will be next semester and hopefully for the uh, foreseeable future. Perfect. Yeah, he's a funny and a really smart and great guy. Uh, and the other study you mentioned was, I think you were saying how the difference between being supervised and not supervised 
and the people who were supervised saw much greater results. That was, uh, if I'm correct in interpreting that. I guess that's what you'd hypothesize. Particularly in, yeah, yeah, definitely. And particularly hypertrophy. Strength, uh, there was, uh, the, so the squat showed uh, benefits to supervision and the bench press, not as much. It's not really clear why, perhaps because the squat's a more complex movement pattern and perhaps because more we had more men in the study and they... Uh, than females and men bench more than they squat. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, certainly the hypertrophy and the vast majority of muscles that uh, muscle sites that we looked at had uh, really superior results, and in some cases, you know, quite uh, quite impressively so. Yeah, no, it, I think it makes sense for people who, like you said, for someone like myself who's been training for like over a decade and kind of knows how to push themselves. I, I guess I can say that. Uh, I don't think that sounds too arrogant to say that. And similar with yourself, Brad, um, the difference between having someone there versus you internally kind of motivating yourself, probably not as large for someone who's been training less time. But I mean, like you said, they've been training three, four years, which is a decent period of time still. Yeah, I think the obviously interesting next study would be to have people like yourself doing this except it's really difficult to get people like yourself to volunteer yeah. for studies, or at least a sufficient number of them. We do get, there were some, you know, again, our criteria is just a minimum one year training experience, but um, how that transposes to other lifters, you know, more experienced lifters, we just can't say, or highly yeah. experienced lifters. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, again, uh, that's why I've got you on the show, because uh, your lab is coming out with stuff all the time. And it, it's super exciting. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because I've been it's kind of a hobby horse of mine at the moment, because there's been just more literature coming out kind of uh, relatively like every few months, and there's a growing body of evidence for it now. And that is kind of range of motion as it pertains to hypertrophy. And we actually talked about it last time because your review um, before Milo's that came out, uh, looking at range of motion um, and its influence on hypertrophy kind of talked about this a little bit because there weren't many studies when you did yours, uh, where you reviewed everything. And uh, there was some studies that looked at kind of partials in that kind of long muscle length versus full range of motion. But now there's there's been many more. So uh, without myself blabbing too much, have you been, I, and well, I say, have you been keeping up with it? I, I'm sure you've been keeping up with it. And has it changed your perspectives on it? Any of anything in as relation to your thoughts on range of motion and hypertrophy? Yeah. So I certainly think the literature is quite compelling that at least in certain muscles, uh, there is a benefit uh, to, or, or that the long length has superior effects than the shortened length positions of training. So that a number one, if you do partial reps in the shortened range, you are shortchanging your muscle growth. Whereas if you do partials in the lengthened range, you probably, in general, it seems to be at least as good as doing a full range of motion, at least in the muscles that we're looking at, the limb muscles, and perhaps even greater because you can get more volume load within that particular range. Now, that said, I want to, a um, couple things with that. Uh, we only, we don't have evidence like in the pecs, good evidence in the pecs and the bat and the trapezius and the rhomboids, um, in the deltoids, uh, the glutes, um, although I am aware of a study in the glutes that seems not to show that that's the case, but anyway, I think that's certainly, we need a lot more evidence on that uh, topic. Um, that's number one. I, I do think some interesting, it, it at least brings about some interesting practical uh, implications. Number one, mechanistically, there is some good logical rationale where there's different pathways for active tension, which would be seen in the, so like when you're doing a fully shortened, like training in the shortened position, it would be really mostly active tension. When you're in the stretch position, there at least seemingly is going to be greater passive forces that are involved. And I don't know how technical you want to go here, but there's a filament bag three pathway, uh, which is an active pathway uh, that, that at least there's good, some good logical rationale and some, some decent evidence behind that. There is a focal adhesion kinase pathway, which is an enzyme in costumers, uh, which are sensors within the uh, muscle membrane. Uh, which again have 
uh, active, seem to have more active uh, effects. And then on the other side, we have other passive uh, pathways, such as uh, the nuclear flattening theory, where nuclei get flattened, um, Titan, Titan involved uh, uh, issue, you know, when I say issues, Titan involved um, moda, modus operandi. So anyway, I, I think that uh, combining the two, conceivably, if you're having, getting more active tension might enhance one pathway to a greater extent, getting more passive might uh, again, have greater, in a different way, get greater effects, and then conceivably combining them. Now, is it possible? It does seem that you get the best of both worlds in the Linton position, but that doesn't mean that combining them wouldn't even be better. We actually carried out a study. Um, I collaborated on this with a group from Brazil. We had four conditions. We had a um, you probably read this one, but we had a shortened position. This was in the quads, so a leg extension, short position, a lengthened position, a full range. And then we had another group that did half the reps in the shortened position, or half the sets in a shortened position, and half the sets in a lengthened position. And uh, the group that did half the short and half the lengthened really didn't get any better results than the uh, lengthened position, but they didn't do worse on, for the most part. So I do think so. A couple of things that I would say to this, I think that there may be a benefit to adding in some partial lengthens um, for the limb muscles. So for the arms, for the quads, the hamstrings, the calves. So we do have some evidence in these muscles that there may be, uh, there or that there seems to be beneficial effects in that respect. There doesn't seem to be a detriment to maybe adding a set or two or however you want to structure your program. Of course, the programming is always going to depend upon how you're conceiving the totality of your program. But it would seem that uh, full range of motion would be for the majority of sets. That would be my recommendation just based on the literature, which would kind of get you the best of all worlds and also be time efficient. Like you could start doing partials here and then partials here and just becomes a very time inefficient workout. And I don't think you get a very good bang for your buck. And you also then introduce more fatigue in that. So I, I just don't think that really is a great way to train. But perhaps as finishers, you do some partials. Uh, I think those are areas that are really um, rife for future investigation. And without that uh, evidence, I think it's certainly good to uh, experiment with it. Very interesting. I guess, would it be fair to say then, if someone was looking at this research and they were thinking, ah, like it seems length and partials are the way to go, and they excluded the short position from their training completely, do you think they'd be losing out on something? I do. Uh, so there's a couple of things there. First of all, now you could say, I don't give a shit about strength, but you know, th there's certainly a functional aspect so that when you train in a shortened position, the strength adaptations are pretty much specific to the uh, range that you're training in. So if you're doing just length of position, you're going to get a, there is a, uh, you know, a short, well, I don't want to use the word short here, but a, a small range of motion outside of that range that you'll still uh, achieve some benefits in. But certainly throughout the range, you're going to reduce the strength uh, transfer there. And that that has implications just to functional capacity. Um, there, are, there are also... Um, uh, to me, I think, again, as I pointed out, potential mechanistic issues that if we look purely from the mechanism of active um, active sensors, it just seems logical that when you're in a shortened position and then there's less passive elements involved that you're enhancing the active elements. So uh, I, I just would say that without further, without good evidence to the contrary, it makes sense to train in a, in a full range. And most of the evidence that we have seems to show that you're getting roughly similar results through full range as you do from length. And there's been a few that like our study showed in some muscles. Um, it's been a while since uh, we published that study. So I forgot the specifics, but in a couple of the sites that we looked at, we looked at multiple sites, there was some better growth in the uh, length and position. I believe it was distally. Um, which, by the way, has some interesting implications as well, is that the greater growth seems to be more distal. Uh, so I, I can speculate on some rationales there, but I think we might want to 
save that for a different day because that can get it that that can go down a whole rabbit hole. But okay. anyway, I, I do think that uh, there, there's just the evidence at this point would point to the the uh, use of full range for global hypertrophy and then perhaps adding in some partials to perhaps enhance particularly distal hypertrophy. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think it's, um, it's interesting also you mentioning kind of the difference. Cause I think a lot of people are looking at this and they're like thinking there's a significant difference between full range of motion versus, versus the partials. And I think it's only really maybe the calves with, with the Warner keys lab, they've done so many studies on the calves where they've actually seen quite significant differences between uh, kind of individuals. But again, I, I think most people they're studying are untrained. Uh, they're like a, few, a lot of us have been training our calves for a huge amount of time. So I don't think we'd maybe see that huge difference. And the areas that you mentioned delts and also back haven't been studied directly. They're the areas that I'm particularly interested in because with a lot of um, like traditional lateral raises, dumbbells, they don't have that kind of large amount of tension in that lengthen position. Same with back, it's often that the, it's the easiest portion of the lift is also the lengthen position where there's least tension. So it's like, those are the two areas I'm really interested to see kind of because theoretically they could have the, the biggest impact, I guess. Totally agree. And the problem with that is, is that particularly like the back, very difficult to do hypertrophy analyses, uh, especially if you're going to use ultrasound, trying to get the same spot. You could use a permanent tattoo, which can be problematic for uh, some, uh, not permanent, semi-permanent tattoo uh, or tattoos if you want to look at multiple sites. Same with the pecs. The pecs are somewhat easier, um, but still, I, I, I just think that there are more difficult muscles uh, to study in that realm. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, the tattoo is funny because uh, Ben House recently came on the podcast. I'm not sure if you, you're aware of Dr. Ben House, but he's very interested in finding kind of ways to measure muscle hypertrophy like very closely. And he was like, tattoos are one of the ways. So I wonder if what you're mentioning there is, or 70 permanent tattoos is what he was kind of alluding to. Uh, right. But yeah. Um, and you mentioned potentially, I think last time you said there were you, a colleague of yours was working on maybe a study looking at a muscle that might respond better to the short range even has did, has that come to fruition? Have you got anything you can share in that okay. regard? I can't, well, I can, to some extent, so that is my colleague, Brett Contreras and he's he <laughs> he looking at muscle hypertrophy in the glutes, of course. And, uh, he just completed, or when I say he just completed, he funded a study that is at a Mike Roberts lab in Auburn. And, um, I will, you can have him on to, uh, give you, so it hasn't been published and certainly I know they've just finished data collection, but yeah, he's, he's looking at the hip thrust versus the squat, which I kind of alluded to uh, earlier that. We'll see how that uh, comes out. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very interesting because I guess, again, if we're thinking the squats, the deep stretch on the glutes versus like hip thrust where it's not heavily loaded in that stretch position. So that'd be very interesting to see it because uh, it would be nice if everything responded the same way in terms of like every muscle, but it's also the human body's complex and things don't always go the way you want them to. Well, and, and remember this too. So just looking at the squat, just makes sense. So when you're doing the upper, the uh, final portion of a squat, mm -hmm. there's very little tension on the muscles. So as you're standing up, the gravity is just not, your, your muscles are just not under that much gravity at that point. Whereas the major, um, so it just could be a function. So how, whether that is due to the lengthened position when you're getting the greatest benefit in the fully short, in the fully lengthened position is a function of the length itself or the function that you're, muscle it's just the most difficult the muscle is under the greatest load under gravity you know those are things mechanistically we don't know but yeah. anyway i do think it'll be interesting that will be something to uh to look out for and yeah, they use absolutely. the mri by the way for the glutes so that'll be oh a cool really interesting study fantastic um nice so the next topic i wanted to chat about was something you uh recently posted about on your instagram it was a, a new review that delved into the underlying physiology of the response to training with low loads. So this was like uh, up to 30% of your one rep max. Um, obviously people hopefully are aware that we can train with a wide variety of rep ranges or loading zones and still get great hypertrophy. And in the review, you had a lot of practical kind of recommendations in terms of the use for that. So like limited equipment, so you can't load heavy, um, following higher loads with the lower loads potentially, and then also for injury or rehab management. And I, I just wondered if you think 
someone who is trying to maximize their hypertrophy, similar kind of to the question of training at long muscle lengths and not training at shorter ones. Do you think someone's missing out if they always focus on maybe heavier loading zones and, and never use those lighter weights? I do. Uh, when I, when you ask me, do I think so? I think there's the possibility. So I always have to couch this. I'm not saying there is, but I'm saying that I think there is a good rationale for it at least, or, or at least a reasonable rationale. So to me, everything comes down to cost benefit. What is the cost of doing something versus what is the potential benefit? And if your benefit exceeds the cost, then you want to employ it and vice versa. If the cost exceeds the benefit, then you probably don't. And I think this is a case where the benefit exceeds the cost. So I'll give you some rationales here. Number one, and we discussed this in that paper, that was a review paper. I'll give a shout out to uh, Jonathan Weekly, uh, who was the lead author on that. And he uh, he led the way for that paper and the collaborator he got myself. He got Stu Phillips uh, as another collaborator on there. And I thought it was a really nice collaborative project and uh, it's open access so people can, maybe you can link that to the uh, yeah. to the YouTube. Um, so we did get into some of the mechanisms and interestingly, there are diff some different intracellular signaling pathways that are activated with lighter loads versus heavier loads. Now, I will say this too, that the intracellular signaling research is somewhat all over the place. So I'm. Uh, as much as I'd like to say, we, we certainly know that muscle hypertrophy is regulated through anabolic and catabolic intracellular signaling, but how it ultimately winds up doing so is still very much a mystery. And that uh, you look at some studies showing certain things and other studies showing very different things and trying to piece them together, my eyes glaze over sometimes when I look at the differences between uh, you know studies that are that we're trying to make sense of. Yeah. But with that said, I think at least it gives some, some ra rationales to it. Um, so conceivably, if let's say heavier loads are activating one anabolic pathway and lighter loads are activating a different anabolic pathway, conceivably you're gonna, you could get a synergistic hypertrophic response. They could be redundant. I don't know, but I think again, there's a logical basis at least whereby it they would be synergistic. Number two, there is some evidence that um, muscle protein, the muscle protein synthetic response is greater in the <clears throat> non-contractile elements, so non-myofibrillar uh, uh, protein synthesis component is greater with lighter loads. Now that would speak towards quote unquote sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, if your goal is bodybuilding, uh, and some of that might be, of course, uh, due to mitochondria and other T tubules that ultimately draw more water into more fluid into the cell. But again, not getting into the weeds with, uh, with the mechanistic aspects of that. Um, I think it just at least gives credence to the fact if you're a bodybuilder or just any dude who wants to maximize their muscle growth or, or gal, uh, I think that that would lend credence to using at least some lighter load training. And finally, there is equivocal evidence um, that there may be a fiber type re or a specific response that uh, lighter load training may target type one fibers and that uh, heavier load training may target type two fibers. I want to make sure I note that it doesn't mean that you're just getting one versus the other, because it's quite clear that you get type two hypertrophy with light load training and quite a lot of it. But um, could it be that you get somewhat more with uh, heavier load training and somewhat more uh, type one fiber, uh, fiber hypertrophy with lighter load training? It's possible. Uh, how much of a difference would that make to the average person? My guess is probably not a lot. Could it make a difference to yourself as a bodybuilder? It could. Uh, I'm to the contrary of that, though. We we did carry out a study a few years ago where we looked at calf hypertrophy using high reps versus low reps. In the, and we looked at the soleus versus the gastroc. The soleus is a primarily type one dominant muscle and did not show any difference with uh, light versus heavy load training. So that would kind of refute that theory. But there have been several studies that do show a benefit. And we just published a um, 
a study on blood flow restriction training using light loads, which again, does seem to show benefits to type one hypertrophy. So putting it all together, I would say that um, when I program for a bodybuilder, uh, I do uh, give a spectrum of loading ranges. I think it's beneficial. Generally, I focus on the uh, moderate range because it's just more efficient. Uh, but sprinkling in some higher rep training and some heavier load training. Um, I do think that it's probably better to do to focus your lighter load training with the single joint movements just because we did a study. Um, this goes back oh, almost a decade ago now, but the, really the first study to look at this topic in resistance trained individuals. So we looked at 10 to 12 reps in one group versus 25 to 35 in another. And I will tell you that the, uh, and they was, these were resistance trained subjects with four years experience. They were miserable the first week and the acidosis that's built up. So there's just so much uh, discomfort and half of them puked, uh, but particularly was discomforting was the multi the squats in particular. So your 20, 25 rep, squats were just pretty brutal. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change, sign up today and let's revive stronger. It sounds incredibly brutal. I think I've I've tried it a few times on some multi joint lifts, like a, a leg press or something. But I can imagine, especially on like a squat, some of the kind of supporting musculature can just start fatiguing, and the burn that you get like in your lower back maybe. And uh, whenever I think of kind of the acidosis and things, I think of leg extensions. Just pushing through that is bad enough. Like high repetitions, let alone like in some of these other things. So. Uh, again, I think that makes a lot of sense that you're not throwing out what could potentially be a tool in a toolbox. So there's nothing to lose by using the higher repetitions, right. potentially theoretically something to gain there. So it's kind of maybe a bit short-sighted if your kind of goal is maximum muscle growth to throw out anything above like, I don't know, 15, 15 repetitions or something. Yeah, no, no evidence of a detriment. So uh, yeah. basically on a whole muscle level, hypertrophy is similar. So there would be no logical rationale I could think of where adding in, uh, you could say if you just did light loads, would you maybe losing out some type two gains? You know, it's, it's questionable, but that's possible. Um, but I, I, and you could be miserable too. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's not fun. But assuming if you're a bodybuilder, look, you tell bodybuilders to eat wheatgrass all day and they'll do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they're, you're highly motivated. For, for the average individual, I think this is really a lot of nothing that then they become tools as to use what's preferential to you. Or if you have joint related injuries, you might yes. want to gravitate towards lighter loads. But we're talking, so my, as a former bodybuilder, you're a current bodybuilder. I assume you're still uh, competitive. Yep. Um, you know, that's my mind thinks what, what can we do to optimize hypertrophy? And uh, many of my followers, that's their, that's why they follow me because I've, I've had that goal uh, of seeking out optimization strategies for hypertrophy since I got into this field. And I don't think that'll ever go. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one argument uh, that some might make, and I think you alluded to this in the paper where higher reps and yeah actually you kind of essentially stated it there where higher reps are more potentially fatiguing so they're uncomfortable they're maybe more fatiguing would that potentially limit volume if we we're to use it that way and you said here in the paper you said further investigation is needed to understand the proximity to failure that one must practice to induce these adaptations of hypertrophy because i guess if you could leave more reps in the tank with the higher reps the potentially less fatiguing that way yeah, so a couple of things there. First of all, they're acutely fatiguing. There's no evidence that they're more chronically fatiguing. So what I mean by that is they're 
like between sets, the acidosis that builds up can take a while to dissipate. Now that said, I mean, you do a heavy, uh, heavy set of triples. That's that's centrally fatiguing. So there's it's kind of a different type of fatigue. You're talking peripheral fatigue versus central fatigue. But um, as opposed to let's say more moderate rep range, you're going to get greater acidosis, a greater hydrogen ion buildup, and thus potentially it can impact your ability then to come back for the next set. But it, if you take a longer rest period, that would solve that, number one. Number two, I, I will say this, there does seem to be a rationale where if you do, if you consistently train with lighter loads, your body builds up buffering capacity uh, so that that does dissipate. The body is very good at becoming adaptive. Um, not well studied, but there is certainly some evidence that that is the case. Um, and to your point as to uh, investigating uh, I, I assume your point is what what did I mean by what, what did we mean by that? Um, yeah. Yeah. So what further investigation, really, the studies that we have currently have looked at, they we try to push them all to failure, to muscle failure. It would be good to know how how many uh, reps in reserve really can you stop short of and still gain uh, similar amounts of muscle for a given high rep range. So let's say we're talking 30 reps. Uh, 30 or 30 RM. Can you stop at 25? Can you stop at 22? I, I mean, at what point can you stop and still gain the same amount of muscle? Or do you really need to go? We, we don't know. We're assuming that you need to be very close to failure. Uh, we, uh, our group, I collaborated on a study with Brazil that showed when people stopped very well short of failure with high reps, it was much more detrimental than stopping. So it was like, I'm drawing a blank as to the exact, this was now like four years ago we published this, but it was something like stopping uh, 10 reps short of failure for a light load versus, so at like 25 reps, it was stopping at like 15 reps versus a 12 reps were stopping at eight. They were like on a percentage basis, they were stopping similarly, but anyway, the heavier loads, I guess, as you'd expect, did get greater gains. So we need more evidence as to looking at, um, where is the where can you stop and still gain the same amount? I think that's important, has important implications not only for bodybuilders, but just for the general public as well, and particularly those like we were talking about with injuries or with um joint related yeah. conditions, osteoarthritis. So each study begets another. There's just so much to yeah. study. Uh I'm a kid in the candy store, but yeah, look, <laughs> uh we have a certain amount of uh we have a certain bandwidth as far as what we could do. So when we put out these types of papers, hopefully others read this and say, hey, that would be a great idea. And it spurs new uh, new research. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad uh, you clarified the fatigue element of that because I have heard it said within kind of our space, I guess, that higher reps are inherently more fatiguing than lower reps, which was always surprising to me uh, because, uh, like you said, acutely, I could see that. But uh, the lower rep training, I think always, I learned, like you said, centrally, I always felt more fatigued, uh, kind of taking more out of from me mentally in that sense versus something uh, higher rep. And especially because yeah. a lot of the higher rep stuff you tend to do on isolation based work, which is inherently less kind of centrally taxing as well. Correct. There are different types of fatigue. And again, I think it's also important to point out that it also would be exercise dependent. So if you're doing, again, squats, with high reps, the type of fatigue that you're going to experience throughout with the uh, metabolic acidosis that's building up uh, through the circulatory system would be different than, of course, if you're just doing, let's say, leg extensions, which is going to tend to have more peripheral, it's going to uh, localize the peripheral fatigue. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Amazing. So the next uh, one that I wanted to talk about, again, another review that you uh, concluded, mechanical stress is the primary hypertrophic driver. And uh, I think, first of all, so for the listeners, if you could just briefly describe what mechanical stress means, it would be great. Yeah, it's um, it's when the muscle is forces are imposed on the muscle, and um, you know, a lot of people, um, and and in my pa paper that's been cited, God knows how many times in my master's thesis, the mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy and their application and resistance training, I call it it's. Uh, kind of the same as mechanical tension. However, mechanical tension uh, is somewhat of a misnomer in term mechanical, well, when I say misnomer, mechanical tension is specific from a physics standpoint to a pulling force, 
Whereas when we talk about mechanical stress, it also can be to a compression force. So a muscle contract, conceivably, people can, when they're taking the term literally, tension can refer to stretching a muscle. Uh, just like stretching a rubber band, we talk about the tension in a rubber band when you when you pull it. You know, if you could compress a rubber band, you're not there's no tension in the rubber band. So anyway, I think if we're looking at it from a technical standpoint. Mechanical stress is a more technically sound term, but the term mechanical tension is used throughout the literature, and I personally don't have a problem with it. But I know some people have raised that. So, um, and your question is. Uh, what is SAG is great. You answered a question that I had there as well because I I did notice it was mechanical stress. I was like, oh, most people like a lot of people use mechanical tension. So I wanted to hear what the reason for that was. So you actually answered that one. Um, and I guess when people hear this, when they think about kind of this mechanical stress, they maybe think like again, we kind of talked about it. More load is better. They think kind of the the higher load or put on the muscle. Surely that's the more mechanical stress that you're putting through it. But I'd love to hear you kind of uh, clarify that for the audience. Yeah, so that is not not completely true. Uh, so certainly heavier loads will create, if you're just looking at, let's say, a rep doing one repetition, yeah, you're heavier, a heavier load will give you more tension than a lighter load or more, more stress for that particular repetition. Um, also, you could say that in a given set with the same number of repetitions, so let's say I'm doing a set of 12, if I'm using a heavier load, I will overall get more mechanical stress, more mechanical tension than if I were using a lighter load throughout that series of repetitions. But there is also a an effect of uh, of fatigue ability, of fatigue or or the effort involved. So as you are uh, doing more reps, let's say I do I'm doing a curl with um, fifty kilograms, um, and then I do so I'll get a certain number of reps with 50 kilograms. Let's say I then do another set with 30 kilograms. If I take that set to failure, the last number of reps as I keep continuing on are going to give more mechanical stress because the body, the muscles need to recruit higher threshold motor units to overcome the fatigue that's being built up to ultimately co uh, complete, to carry out that movement pattern. I think that's, really well explained because i think a lot of people get a bit too focused on like load and they're like i don't know oh, when i do a low bar squat i'm using more weight versus like a high bar squat and i'm trying to grow my quads and it's like well but it doesn't mean you're getting more mechanical stress through the quads through a low oh. bar just because there's no more weight right your, your other muscles are taking over for the load that you're lifting yeah but yeah you could say if i do a set of uh, 10 on a front squat versus a back squat that yeah you're getting more throughout your body and let's say you're using of course heavier loads with the back squat than you are with the front squat throughout your body there's more mechanical tension but on the given muscle there might not be because where there wouldn't be as a general rule because of the difference in the form that you're using your glutes are going to take over more as a general rule more of the load uh, than you would in a front squat so and perhaps other muscles as well so and I think that the key point you mentioned was the proximity to failure. So it's kind of like, as long as you're within a proximity to failure, that's that's kind of the key point for driving the mechanical tension. Correct. But I do want to point out too, that in um, some people dismiss like the earlier reps, like say, well, then they don't, why do let's say lighter loads? Because that, that's not necessarily true. Because again, the, and this is just, we don't really have a mechanistic, great mechanistic understanding, but conceivably, there's still tension on your mu your first rep on a light load set. There is tension on your muscles. So is that tension not giving any uh, stimulation for muscle growth? We don't know that, but conceivably your type one fibers are under load during that period of time. And the type one fibers are more indefatigable. So they basically they're fatigue resistance to a greater degree. Could it be that keeping their keeping those fibers under load for greater periods of time, stimulate those type one fibers to a greater extent. These are, you know, people, again, I, I do get frustrated in the field because we have a lot of people who want to make a name for themselves on social media. And the way to do that is by being definitive. People want definitive answers. And I know a lot of times people can become frustrated with me because I'm, I hedge a lot. I, I hedge a lot because 
unless I am sure of something or have a high degree of confidence, I'm always going to going to hedge when my confidence in something isn't good. And we should never um, over extrapolate just to get more followers. And I, I do think that that is something some people do. Other people just do it out of naivety. They They would hear another person say something and then they just take that as gospel because they're deferring to authority or who they perceive as authority. But the true scientists, you know, we need to be very cautious when we're we're talking about these things, and we just don't have a good handle at this point. And uh, I have to say, Brad, that's why I have a huge amount of respect for you, because I've seen it throughout your entire career that you always make sure to never state a claim that hasn't got evidence for it or overstate claims. Um, but I know exactly individuals who do that within the industry, and um, it, it is... Uh, you know why they do it because people are drawn to those characters because they give them nice black and white clear answers and uh, it's just i don't know i guess a fault of humanity in some ways but i hope the audience here at least have now heard it if they they aren't already aware that those are the individuals to kind of keep a keep an eye on (laughs) versus kind of follow blindly and i think your point here is essentially is kind of like absence of evidence is an evidence of absence like people are throwing out those higher repetition ranges and saying those initial reps aren't doing anything when they haven't actually got any good evidence to suggest that that is fundamentally to the facts that's correct and again that would be a rationale why you might uh why lighter load uh, sets might have added benefit uh for stimulating type or one of the reasons for stimulating type 1 fibers um we just don't know. And I think my next question kind of runs alongside this a little bit because some people are saying it is just mechanical tension or mechanical stress. And the other two that you kind of proposed in terms of muscle damage and metabolic stress aren't necessarily doing anything. Do you, where are your thoughts in regards to this? Have you throw, Are you ready to throw those ones out or are you still, are they tentatively potentially pathways? Well, you, you can't throw it out unless there's good evidence to show that that there is no effect and there's not anyone. I mean, I challenge anyone and they do, they can't do it because I, I know this literature better than anyone or certainly as well as anyone. Um, there's equivocal evidence on both ways. So am I ready to throw it out? No. Am I also, would you say, am I ready to say that they're definitely uh, important mechanisms? No. I, I think that we published a paper. I know you've had me on since, but uh, my colleague uh, Henning Wakaraj led the uh, paper it's called stimuli and sensors of uh, anabolism. I, I forgot the specifics, but I can send you that and you can link it. It was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, 2019. And we went through it and really not that much has changed since then. I wouldn't, there, there wouldn't be much differences, but I mean, I can make, if I wanted to, and I just want to be like some people on the internet, I can make a very good case for those who aren't familiar with the literature, to show that, yes, metabolic stress has a huge effect on our purchase, or is certainly a major player in it, and muscle damage in the same way. Um, But if you want to look at the totality of evidence, we have evidence on both sides. There's evidence that makes me say, you know what? And I kind of have gone back and forth certain times. I see another study come out and say, you know what? This is kind of making me rethink it. And then you get another study that's that goes the other way. Um, I'll say this, that there's evidence that we have blood flow restriction evidence where people in casts, they just tie off, they basically, they occlude the uh, leg, so the quadricep muscles and, and the hamstrings. Uh, so they're immobilized in casts and just occluding the leg for a couple of minutes, a few minutes every day, substantially attenuates hypertrophy in the quadriceps and actually shows slight hypertrophic increases in the flexors and the leg flexors and the hamstrings. Now, do we know that there is metabolic buildup through uh, collusion, but could it be hypoxia? Could there be a, what is causing that? It certainly isn't mechanical tension. So it does at least speak to the fact that there, there seem to be other um, stimuli that are in effect. Now, that also doesn't mean that that would be additive. So while someone, you could say, and someone's in a cast, yeah, there are other uh, stimuli, but that doesn't mean that they will translate when someone is actually lifting a weight, that maybe that becomes redundant at that point. Um, and again, we've outlined this in in, um, in collaborations that I've done with several labs now. Uh, muscle damage. By the way, uh, I will kind of go down the rabbit hole that I said before, but you can make a case that uh, where the lengthened position 
uh, is getting distal hypertrophy? Well, it's been shown that greater muscle damage tends to occur distally. Uh, is that helping to drive uh, through lengthened uh, position training? Could that be explanatory, at least to some degree, why there's greater uh, distal hypertrophy? These are things we don't know. And anyone that's making strong conclusions, uh, in my opinion, is, is highly misguided. And I'm being very charitable when I say that. Um, because if you want to be a true scientist, we could say, look, I, I can have an opinion. I could say, you know what? I really don't think that's the case. I can't prove it. You know, I, uh, I certainly uh, do cannot say that there's evidence, but in my opinion, I think it's far-fetched. All right. I, I, then I can disagree and I could say, well, I don't think it's far-fetched, but that's a matter for debate. When people come on and say, we now know that that's the only mechanism, it's just silliness. Uh, again, it's people that generally don't, are not familiar with the literature and are parroting what other people have said yeah. or people that are looking to uh, sell stuff and or, or to make a name for themselves. So uh, I will go on record in saying that until we get greater evidence, my I would say the evidence is fairly weak at this point, but uh, certainly I can't discount a, a role. I, I will say this, I, I will discount a prominent role. So I think that Certainly, we know that without mechanical tension, the gains are substantially attenuated. That does not much, but does that that does not mean that there might not be additional benefits through other mechanisms. And I'm reserving judgment at this point until we we have better evidence. I think that's very fair and very well said. And uh, another uh, study you kind of recently spoke about as well was this kind of potential, the pump may be enhancing hypertrophy. It was this uh, greater post-exercise blood flow in individuals with a higher percentage of fast switch muscle fibers. So that was another one that I thought was interesting. I don't know if you've got much to say on that. Yeah, that was, uh, again, a, to me, a very interesting study, a really well done study uh, on muscle typology. Another one, hopefully you can link that. Uh, I thought the authors just did an amazing job and they looked at so many different uh, things. They, they looked at frequency of training and the effects, which actually was showed some interesting results for hypertrophy. And anyway, um, from a typology standpoint, I think one of the real interesting findings that I thought was that the type uh, two fibers had more than 50% greater blood flow, up to, I think it was 60, two thirds, 66% or so greater blood flow. Uh, in the fast twitch fibers, and we know, when I say we know, there's evidence that fast twitch fibers have roughly 50% greater hypertrophic potential than your type one fibers, your slow twitch fibers. So it makes you think, so if they're getting greater blood flow and they're thus being re reperfused to a greater extent post-exercise, could that be involved in their hypertrophic response? It's just hypothesis. It's not, yeah. it's certainly not causal evidence. So I'm certainly not saying, wow, we have a, a clear link. I'm saying that this, and hopefully my, I try to convey these things in posts that I make, but a lot of times people just see what they want to see and run yes. with it. Um, but I think again, when you don't have good evidence, so again, it's very difficult to study mechanisms. And this kind of goes back to the last question you would ask too. Why don't we have it? Why can't we tell whether mechanical what, what, uh, whether mechanical tension is the only mechanism or whether metabolic stress is involved in muscle damage? Because when you uh, manipulate one variable, invariably you cause other variables to be manipulated. You, you have other issues which confounds your ability to draw causality. You can really only draw causality when you can localize an effect and rule out other variables. That becomes extremely difficult in mechanistic work. And similarly, and uh, there are just a lot of problems trying to look at uh, cell swelling. We do know, by the way, in vitro, uh, meaning in a test tube, that if you hydrate a cell, and this has been shown in multiple cells, including muscle, um, that if you hydrate a cell, it will increase anabolism, so increase muscle protein synthesis, and decrease muscle protein breakdown, proteolysis. That's a hypertrophy home run for those in the States. We know about baseball. Yeah. Um, so now can you extrapolate in vitro evidence into in vivo and into the living? No. So, but it, again, it, you try to build hypotheses when you don't have compelling um, uh, good evidence that, that would give causality. We try to build it on logical reasoning on a, from a logical basis. And I think just like with metabolic stress and, and muscle damage, there is, some, I think, fair 
logical evidence, uh, you know, when you look at it piecemeal and try to then build a case like a lawyer would for saying, all right, here's the, here's the case for, here's the case against, uh, that there's an effect. And I think that it does lend itself towards at least um, giving credence to the possibility that the pump might be beneficial. And again, I would say, where is the detriment then to doing some pump training in your workout? Uh, no logical rationale that I can see that would show a negative effect, possible benefit. I think that it's when you ask me when I program for a high level bodybuilder, do some pump training. Yeah, I think that's again really well said. Again, it's that kind of there's no uh, downsides to it. So why would we throw another potential tool out of our toolbox that's it's going to drive mechanical stress or mechanical tension anyway? So maybe it's also we get some benefits with the pump there. And uh, I think it's clear to a lot of us that the kind of um, this muscle damage and th the pump are very correlated to a lot of the things that seem to drive hypertrophy, like you said, long muscle lengths and kind of high tension and sometimes even novelty and things like this can play a role in progressive overload, like introducing higher weights and loads. Wow. So I, I, I'm with you in terms of not throwing them out as potential mechanisms and um, interesting nonetheless. But uh, Brad, that I, we've covered all my questions. I've had you here almost an hour. I really appreciate your time. Uh, if people want to kind of keep up with you uh, or if you've got anything else to share, go ahead. They can just Google me. I, I mean, I'm... I'm on Instagram. I'm on uh, Twitter. I do some Facebook stuff still, uh, as much as the algorithms suck with Facebook. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I look to put out uh, content and, uh, and free content to all, and most importantly, like I said, to further the field from a research perspective. So uh, uh, I'll just again close by saying kudos to my students. Uh, and hopefully they will all be on your show at some point, or at least many of them on your show in the future, because I just have so many terrific students that are uh, a joys to teach and joys to mentor. And uh, they are the next generation that hopefully can further the stuff that I'm doing. Absolutely. Uh, I was just speaking to, uh, do you know Mike Zodos? Have you yeah, heard the name? Yeah, yeah. Mike. Uh, he was just also saying the same with his students who are, are coming up uh, under him and saying how amazing they are and well, I was just kind of thinking about how thankful I am for people like yourself, Mike, who really made kind of science sexy. And so there seems just there's so many young individual or younger individuals getting into it now. It's hard to call them young. I'm not that much older, but maybe a decade on them. Uh, so it's just amazing to see all of them. And absolutely, I would be honored to bring them on the show and discuss these things. And uh, I, again, big thank you to you, Brad, for, for coming on and uh, leading the way as always. Awesome. Hopefully I'll be on in the future. For sure. Cheers, Brad. Okay. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though. It's reality and we know how to do it. And we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight-week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cup movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.